Hello everyone, welcome. Let's get Instagram started up as well. Hello everyone, welcome to Thursday Tea Time Live. We are back. Hello everyone, welcome. Well, let me just set that up, sorry. We are back after the summer. So this is the first Thursday Tea Time History Chat Live that we um, we've had for quite a few weeks now. So thank you for everyone coming back and joining me. When I last did a History Chat Live, I think I had around 9,000 followers on Instagram and 2,000 or so on, on YouTube. I'm streaming on both live at the moment. And um, in fact, I now have 107,000 on Instagram and nearly 3,000 on YouTube. So thank you so much. Welcome if you're new here. Every week I do this Thursday tea time chat. Literally, I have a cup of tea with me and we talk history. I have a few things to talk to you about, but you can please drop into the comments anything you've got questions wise, maybe about somewhere I've been that you've seen me share on my stories or in posts while I've been um, absent from here. Um, or maybe anything from the news. Oh, hi, everyone. I can see you joining. Um, Lolcal13 in Canada. Uh, it's me, though. I will tell you what is on the menu for today's live in a moment. Thank you for asking. Um, I do like to know where you're you're from. Um, Patty Crafts, Brentford, New Hampshire. <laughs> Usually, that means you're somewhere else. Are you somewhere exciting at the moment? And uh, and also, if you so if you are watching on YouTube, you can drop me a comment in um, in the comments, <laughs> clearly, and uh, maybe a thumbs up just to let me know that you are good. You can hear me, and yeah, feel free to tell me where you're joining me from as well. So today, because I have been away for a long time, everybody, I don't, I can't remember what date it was. Um, another Canadian, hi, Massachusetts. I went to Massachusetts once. I was a little bit younger. Amsterdam, Suaba, hello. Um, Michigan, bon, uh, Bonski, <laughs> another Michigan. Hello, this is fantastic. So I'm not sure what the last date was. It might have been before, I think it was, bef it must have been before I went on the Life and Times of Elizabeth I tour. So I took that tour in July. I will let you know um, a bit just let you know what happened there um i know many of you um followed on my story on instagram who we've got um uh, magdalene in sweden we've got a missouri texas person bunny is ever in the philippines love my accent <laughs> i keep trying to make it a little bit more english uh you know sort of non-descript as to where i'm sort of which part of england i'm from but i I fail miserably, I think. Um, another person from Canada. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I will let you know, I will talk, tell you a little bit more about the fun we had on the life and times of Elizabeth I tour, because that's happened since I last spoke to you. But after that, I went and I relocated for five weeks to the uh, beautiful, beautiful ancient landscape, landscape of Exmoor. There's someone from Woodstock in the US. Um, <laughs> uh, Helen Hendry wants to know what's on the agenda what am I going to say and what I'm not going to say well there's probably a lot I'm not going to say <laughs> I don't know this is like this is topics for the world so I'm going to talk about the life and times of Elizabeth the first what we got up to um Steph is in Sutton Caulfield that is very close uh I also uh did an interview with Estelle Peronk, which I'll tell you about. We've got um, I had an interview with Jay Britton, who's the Tudor Songbook, which I'll also tell you about. Um, some of the places I've been over the summer, because like I say, really I relocated as opposed to, it's not really a holiday. Uh, well, it is, but it's not. Um, and anyway, I am a busman's holiday type of person. So wherever I go, and seeing as you're into history as well, you probably find this. Do you ever manage to go anywhere without looking at the history of it as well? It's like, it's impossible. So I will, um, <laughs> what did I say? What I was not going to tell you. I don't know what I was thinking. I was going to, that makes it sound like there's something I want to tell you, but I can't, I can't remember what that was. Um, so uh, maybe over the next few weeks, I will fill you in completely on where I've been and what I've been doing, because it's probably too much for today. 
But like I say, I relocated to the ancient, it's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful countryside on Exmoor. Uh, it's in Somerset, which is in the south of, uh, well, Somerset's quite a sprawling um, uh, county, actually, but I was in the Somerset, uh, sorry, the southern region of Somerset, sort of on the Devon border. Um, hi, Turingums. Yes, I've had a great summer. Thank you very much. The weather was fantastic, which being in a tent is um, important. <laughs> so I went to places like Cleve Abbey. If any of you saw my live from there, that's the one live I did over the summer. I'll tell you a bit more about Cleve Abbey because it's one of my absolute favourite places. I went to a place called Dunster Castle. That, it, In fact, I think that Dunster Castle would predate Cleve Abbey and they're not far away from each other um, because Dunster Castle was a Norman castle probably was there may have been something there before um, and you may have seen on my story the other day that I it revealed it's not a secret they they know it's there uh, revealed what is inside the mot so I'll tell you about that as well um yeah, so I spoke uh, the, the interviews I'm going to speak about Estelle Peronk, uh, Jay Britton. Um, it's me that wants me to talk about the Bacton altar cloth. Okay, yeah, we can talk about that in a moment. Let me pop that on my list. Um, yeah, and just a few little things that are going on, things that are coming up. So, where shall we begin? Are you sitting comfortably? Do you have a cup of tea? I do. I need one. I get very thirsty talking. <laughs> so an American student, yes, the camping trip was fun. Um, I put, I don't know about you, but when I go camping, I like to go full on. We have bunting, we have fairy lights. There is nothing that can't be improved by the addition of fairy lights, in my opinion. And when you hear the children on the campsite call it the fairy tent, <laughs> then I know I have succeeded in my quest for making something look pretty. So what should we start with? Let's start with what's available now. So in, was it just before I went away? It might've been just after I got back. I don't know. I spoke to Jay Britton. Jay Britton, if you're not following her already on YouTube and on Instagram is the Tudor songbook. And Jay recreates by singing in her amazingly beautiful soprano voice, the music of the Tudor court. And I got to speak to her um, in my interview with her, which is available now if you'd like to watch it after this. It's available on YouTube. I made that available a couple of weeks ago. And Jay talks about sort of how she came up with the idea, um, how it's sort of working in practice, her costumes. If you follow her on Instagram already, um, you will you will have seen some of her incredible costumes because she is creating an authentic experience. I know that's a word that's used a lot now, but you know it, it's 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 so you get it all around you. You get the obviously the audible, you get the visual, um, and she's performing in places um, like, for instance, for us in on the Life and Times of Elizabeth I tour. She excuse me, she came to uh, Harvington Hall, which is incredible I'll talk a bit more about that as well um and Jay's voice is I mean if you ever get a chance to hear her in real life then do that but her YouTube um and her Instagram are very good as well and she not only did we speak about how she creates the music I was really interested to know how like things like how does she know because it's different notation and think, how does she know that she's creating a sound that is the same as the Tudors would have heard? So I was asking her about that, but also she got to um, handle a book, a music book that had been owned by Anne Boleyn and Anne had written in, in it. I mean, most of us know if you're into uh, the history of Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, we'll know about Anne's books of hours, which are at Hever Castle on display. And once a year on the 19th of May, the anniversary of her execution, they are opened to the page where she wrote. Um, but Jay got to see, I, never, I just never, I'd never heard of this other book. Um, so Jay talks to us about that in the interview as well. So if you're interested in that, um, then after this, 
have a look over on my YouTube channel. It's the British History YouTube channel. If you're watching me on YouTube already, you know where that is. If you're watching me on Instagram and you want to go find it, then there is a link in my bio. Um, and there's there's uh, for patrons, anyone who's a member of my British History Patreon, they get, um, well, you'll get to see the extended version. It's ad free. I don't put any of the adverts in the um, uh, Patreon version. When I interview a historian like Jay, all of my patrons get to submit their own questions to them. Um, so and it's that extended version. It's ad free, usually early as well. If I if I get my timings correct, um, the patrons get all of that. So if you're interested as well, I've completely revised my Patreon. So the um, everyone gets everything and it's five pounds a month so there are there are different tiers which is just actually a hangover from um the way patreon is set up and the way i'd set it up initially and some people like to donate more uh, 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 yeah give me more which is amazing um but if you wanted to join my patreon you get everything for five pound a month anyway that's sort of just to let you know that um and you get to submit your own questions to to the historians and that is the extended version of the interview as well that you get to see that no one else gets to see another person who my patrons have been able to put their own questions to this summer in fact i did it uh, i took a few days i came back for a few days and did some work including interviewing dr estelle perron um i read estelle's book while i was away and if you've been following me while i've been away i've been posting <laughs> quite a lot and one of the books about, about the books that I've been reading where I've been I'm going to share some more of those with you in a moment as well but I read Estelle's book um it's called Blood and uh, Blood Fire and Gold and it is a dual biography of Elizabeth I and Catherine de Medici now these women were contemporary so and not only were they living at the same time they had a lot to do with each other they never met in person but um, Catherine de' Medici basically was the queen mother of France, a role that she uh, carved for herself as well and titled herself. Incredibly fascinating woman. And the Estelle's book is really interesting because it takes us through the timeline as well. It's sort of a chronological order. You can see the, the personalities or the... Um, don't know how you describe it, the uh, sort of the, the way that, that Elizabeth I operates and Catherine de Medici operate, you see them grow as a statesperson, as a woman, you know, you, as an adult, <laughs> you know, from childhood to adulthood, see how they change. She tells that really um, well and also how they're interacting during all of this time. There's also, of course, the very interesting third person, third in influential woman at the time another queen mary queen of scots who of course catherine de medici as her mother-in-law when mary queen of scots is married to her, her son francis has met her in person so you've got this really really interesting dynamic in be between elizabeth and catherine and then add in the fact that you've got mary queen of scots there as well so i was really keen to talk to estelle um and she kindly agreed and we've got the interview that is going to be available in October. And like I say, all of my patrons got to ask, got to submit their own questions to Estelle, which will be in the extended version. So if you like the idea of putting your own questions to historians, then do have a look at my Patreon at Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash British history. And like I say, you can join everyone gets everything. It's five pounds a month. If you want to, to um to to subscribe with for more money um and then that's beautiful and thank you very much it's it's much appreciated but you don't have to so there you are there's two uh historian interviews that are um have been in the pipeline so jay's jay Britton's is available now on youtube talking about Anne Boleyn's music we had quite f a lot of fun i don't i can't remember in the in the extended version or the um main version uh, talking about how um anne and henry may have performed together may have written music together um 
really fascinating conversation actually and the interview with Estelle Pronk will be available in October so that leaves September we are already in September it's the first September everybody just thought I'd break it to you September is always of course the anniversary of the great fire of London of 1666 so it is only fitting that this month's interview his historian interview is with someone to talk about the great fire of London and I interviewed uh, Hazel Forsyth who is um, she's one of the curators at the Museum of London she has written a book called a butcher baker a candlestick maker um, about the great fire of London and her book I've spoken about it before I'm looking looking down there because it's down there I should have got it up but her book talking about the great fire of London looks at it from the um, perspective of all the trades London was absolutely jam-packed of course with different trades and you had your guilds there yeah you know, and every trade was affected of course three quarters of the city was burnt was was ruined and hazel looks at the story of the great fire through those people's eyes and it really opens it up as a human uh a human tragedy a human story now i'm we, we're talking about the museum of london where at the moment if you go you will be able to see quite a um, it's not large, but it, it, it's a quite good, extensive um, exhibition about the Great Fire of London. The Museum of London is moving premises and so will be closed for the next few years. I, I, in the interview, um, Hazel tells us when it's going to be reopened. When it reopens, they're going to be doing the Great Fire of London exhibit aimed at children. And I um, really, uh, really, to be very, very honest, very very disappointed with that idea when you read hazel's book and when she's speaking to us about it in the interview this is a this is a grown-up um horror story really you know a a that that people are working here they're dwelling here they're going to school here they're they're elderly they're being cared for here in the city that is decimated um, it takes years and years and years to recover. The uh, anyone who's ever been and seen the um, the monument that's the monument to the Great Fire of London. You can walk up its three hundred and thirty three steps. Or I just made that up, but it, it's you get a little certificate when you get to the bottom, or at least you used to. That monument is to the recovery of the city after the Great Fire of London, um, and. I don't know. I'm just I'm bitterly disappointed that when the when the museum reopens, that it's going to be aimed at children. I really, really strongly, you could probably gather, believe that it's not a children's story. However, if you want some actual proper information about the Great Fire of London, may I recommend Hazel's book? It's like I say, it's called Butcher Baker, Candlestick Maker. I'm just reading it. It's right over there. Surviving the Great Fire of London and in a few days time, you'll be able to listen to my interview with Hazel as well to talk, talking about the fire. Um, again, patrons, you'll get the extended version, ad free, et cetera, et cetera. And um, patrons put some really interesting questions to Hazel. So there you go. So that's three historian interviews. One that you can get now, one you're going to be able to get soon and Estelle Peronks on the uh, uh, Elizabeth and Catherine, Elizabeth I and Catherine de Medici will be available in October. So shall I tell you a little bit about the life and times of Elizabeth I, seeing as we did this, did anybody follow along the tour? Did they, did you follow along on Instagram? Um, I always share, whenever I'm on tour, by the way, I share, um, a sort of summary I suppose it's going of what we're doing on my story so that you can kind of come along vicariously see where we're going um the tour was on the week that we had the freak heat wave in the UK so it was 40 degrees uh centigrade which is uh 
it's fairly warm for here so but everyone did really well we coped really well had water plenty um and just had to do some things a little bit different but only by sort of making sure we're in cool parts rather than not having to worry about it it's very strange when you're planning uh tours for the summer in england you have to plan for rain wind cold and now apparently 40 degrees heat um uh, let me just see who's oh yes jenna um yes look into it it's been doing uh no, sorry since i've been doing some more research i've had great interest in the great fire since it destroyed the orchards at whitehall too ah interesting interesting at whitehall that's interesting i wonder why because that's further on around the river was that something to do with smoke or something i don't know but um yeah so if you're interested in great five london in the next few days the interview with hazel forsyth will be out to coincide with the anniversary of the great fire which um which burned i think the second till the sixth or second till the second till the fifth I mean, it smouldered for a very long time anyway, so I don't think it sort of just stopped. It's very interesting, though, I think, because there's lots of, I think with the Great Fire of London, it's a bit like something like the Titanic or Henry VIII. It's, it's, a, it's a story that captures, but isn't necessarily looked into in any particularly great detail. And so the summary versions that catch the eye, that hook, are the ones that, um get remembered so um yeah so yeah so let's talk about um oh actually before before i talk about the um the rest of the elizabeth tour uh i said i would share with you what books i've been reading over the summer so one of my aims while i was sort of away so i wasn't doing my lies wasn't doing my newsletters was to get some reading in i don't know how you find fitting in reading but um i need to make more time for it now i've i read some books that go really really well together so i've already mentioned i read blood fire and gold which is the dual biography of elizabeth the first and catherine de medici by dr estelle peronk i was also um sort of overlapping so i was doing audible and normal and uh, books books that you can hold in your hand I uh, read Tudor the family story this is Leander Delisle's book um, if you're interested in the Tudors and you haven't read this book I would say get hold of a copy give it a read it comes across brilliantly on audible and it's it's lovely to read in your hand as well because I think you'll probably want to refer back to it I think there's lots in here that you may not know there was stuff in here that I had either forgotten or didn't know in the first place. So I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it takes you through the entire Tudor story. So that combined with Blood, Fire and Gold by um, Estelle Peronk was great. And the other one that is brilliant to overlap, it's another Leander Delisle book. And it's The Sisters Who Would Be Queen. This is the story of the Grey Sisters. And again, so the Grey Sisters... This overlaps very well with Estelle's book because it's Elizabeth the first who's um, dealing with the other two Grey sisters. So the Grey sisters, obviously everyone knows about Lady Jane Grey, who um, in Edward VI will was that left the throne. Um, she goes into it in a lot more detail. Again, I think it would probably unless it's something you've looked into in detail in the past, she will probably challenge something that you, th the, the story that you think, you know, and then Jane's uh, younger sisters, um, uh, Catherine and Mary, they were still in line to the throne when Elizabeth the first was on the throne. They um, would, would succeed to the throne via the, the will of Henry the eighth. Um, Henry VIII and Edward VI, probably. I'd not thought about that. But um, Elizabeth is consistently refusing, as we know, to name a successor, to name an heir. Um, she's, it, this gives, this is, gives a very interesting view on Elizabeth and just how callous, actually, she could be in 
in her absolute refusal to name a successor. So again, want to want to want to um, understand more about Elizabeth I. Want to understand more about the Tudors. Leander Leander Dadal's book, The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, another definite recommendation. So those are the three that I would um, read in quick succession. Tudor, The Family Story, Leander Delisle, Estelle Peronk's Blood, Fire and Gold, and another one of Leander Delisle's The Sisters Who Would Be Queen. By the way, I don't get any commission on this. I'm literally telling you because I think you will, um, you will find it interesting. Um, and then I went back further, a lot, lot further, to the first major usurpation maybe anyway this is the red prince about john of gaunt helen carr's new book again it to to understand john of gaunt is to help understand what what, what came next um so anyway that is another book i'm hoping to get hold of helen and see if she will do an interview with me and now i'm on to the house of dudley joanne paul and the greatest knight, um, Thomas Ashbridge. We'll see. Maybe now I'm back, my my rate of reading will slow somewhat. But I will I will try. I will try and keep it at a pace. Um, and bring you interviews as well related to those. So back to the Elizabeth tour. So yes, so it's forty degrees. We went to. Um, so the first day we went to Kenilworth Castle and Kenilworth Castle really is one of the most beautiful ruins you will come across. In fact, it was, did you know that part of Kenilworth Castle was actually the Victorians pulled down a bit to make it more romantically ruinous. They did have some funny ideas, but it was from an enthusiastic place. Because in Victorian times, this is when they there was more um, more free time. There was more uh, money in people's pockets, and it saw tourism blow up um, for the first time in any real sense. And um, so, places like Kenilworth Castle sort of paid the price a little bit. But it is an amazing place to go, and we took the group there. It coincided with Elizabeth the first visit. Um, when she had it was the anniversary, should I say, of, <laughs> of Elizabeth the first visit when she was there um, in uh, 1575 um, as part of her 19 day visit. Um, was that 75? I think that was 75. So, um, so we went there and then the, in the afternoon we went to Harvington Hall. Now this was a favourite of people on the tour um it's off the beaten track it is a elizabethan manor house and it tells a story of catholic recusants in elizabethan england and stuart england really but obviously we were focusing on elizabeth and we had leslie smith come as elizabeth she did an audience with elizabeth the first in harvington hall so in this recusants house we had a private tour it was, it was closed to the public so we had the place to ourselves which was just fantastic. Um, and Tracy Borman also came to speak to us at Harvington Hall as well. So it was an amazing day. We got to then eat in the in the hall at Harvington, um, which was wonderful. Unfortunately, the um, the caterers who did an amazing job for us have had their refrigerator trailer stolen today. So that's how come it's on my story today. If anyone was wondering why there was a there's a random sort of call out on my story. It's not what I normally do, but I felt really strongly that anyway, they, these lo lovely people have um have had their trailer stolen, which is bad, but they did a, a wonderful meal at the hall. Um and then the next day we went to Stratford upon Avon um looking at Shakespeare. Shakespeare because of course in Elizabethan, he wrote in Elizabethan times. And we went to his birthplace and to um, to his schoolroom, which you can still visit. Uh, it's it, the, his Shakespeare schoolroom is actually also the Guild Hall. So the Guild Hall of the town, I suppose that, that is, yeah, a, a, um, like a town hall. It's the precursor to the town hall where your mayor would be, your town councillors would be. 
um and and the schoolroom was above that it's still used as a schoolroom for the local school so that was quite, that was amazing um so we had a uh, had um explorer of stratford um what did we do the day after oh yes oh yes this was the other place that people were very um it was an extra on the tour we we had to make a switch um and we put in Penshurst place Penshurst place is very close to heaver castle it is the um the seat of the Sydney family, it was in Elizabethan times, and Mary Sydney, who was Robert Dudley's sister, um, had married into the Sydney's, and she lived there, and Elizabeth would visit her there. Now, Mary Sydney nursed Elizabeth when she fell ill in 1562 with smallpox. Elizabeth was very close to death. She was very close to death. Um, and Mary Sydney, so Robert Dudley's sister, nursed Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth made a good recovery. She had a few scars. Um, Mary Sidney caught smallpox from Elizabeth and and it, it ruined her complexion. It ruined her face. She never went back to court. And she lived at Penso's place and Elizabeth would, would visit her there. Um, apparently never actually really acknowledging, though, uh, bizarrely, what, sacrifice Mary had made for her, which I find interesting. I think Elizabeth I is a character that we can admire, but she she is not a she's not someone to be put on a, a pedestal. She was not perfect in any way. In fact, I think that's her draw. She was very human. She was human. She did callous things. She did nice things. She liked to ignore um, things that were a bit, I don't know, inconvenient. She would procrastinate, sometimes on purpose, a lot of time on purpose, sometimes not. Um, fascinating woman. But anyway, so we got to to, to go around Pencil's place and then we stayed at Hever Castle uh, for our final so two nights we did, yes. And... Um, in fact, Leander was supposed to come and speak to us, but Leander was poorly. So Linda Porter st um, stepped in last minute and came and spoke to our group, which was fantastic. So we had a, a talk from Linda Porter. And um, and then the following night, we did a hidden heaver tour. So we, after hours, got to go around the castle, got to see rooms that aren't on the public route. And we finished off with... Um, a meal in the great hall of Hever. So it was it was really, really amazing. Um, but I didn't have time to come on and do a live in between because I we finished the tour and then three days later I went down to Exmoor. So that's, that's why I've not told you about it. But I'm actually now in the run up to the next tour. So um, I've got this week and next week and maybe the week after, I don't know how many Thursdays we've got in between, but on the 18th of September, I will be taking the next tour. This is our final tour of 2023. This one I'm doing in conjunction with Sarah Morris, who's the Tudor Travel Guide, if you follow her on Instagram or um, YouTube. And we are going on progress with Anne Boleyn. So you'll be able to follow that one again on Instagram. Um, and Yes, Jenny, you do really need to make one of my tours. <laughs> you do. How fantastic would it be to meet you in person? We've seen each other so much over online. Um, so on progress with Anne Boleyn is, oh, you might have seen I did a live with, oh, I did do another live. I did a live from Tewkesbury Abbey um, a couple of weeks ago with Sarah. We were there just uh, checking it out, making sure it's all in the same place. And we... Um, we had a great time <laughs> we had a great time there i i'm really looking forward to taking it up again tewkesbury actually is an extra i've added that in um and actually we're staying near to tewkesbury abbey now which um so you sort of just come out and then there's 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 the abbey there it is which is rather nice in fact the hotel that we're using the, the, there's a bit of a uh 
anyway i won't go into it but the, the hotel that we're using part of the grounds was part of the battlefield of the 1471 battle of tewkesbury this was the final battle of the wars of the roses between um edward the fourth and um well henry the sixth was in the tower of london at the time but his son edward and edward prince of wales was killed and he's buried at tewkesbury abbey so anyway, we're going to Tewkesbury Abbey and uh, you can have a look back later and have a look at our live from there if you like. But that's just one of the places. And the reason we're going, the reason we're going to all the places on that itinerary is we're following um, part of the summer progress of 1535 that Anne Boleyn took with Henry VIII. Now, of course, within less than a year, Anne would be dead. So it's really poignant to... Th- you know, and you're following in her footsteps. Um, and when we're there to think that this was a really happy time for Anne. Um, she was really quite secure. There was, I mean, there was no way anyone could have, no one could have anticipated what was going to happen. Uh, I shared a video the other day about, um, about where Anne is buried, which most of you probably know in St. Peter Advincula at the Tower of London. And um, I think it was in the comments, um, Travis, you might have contributed to this. There was um, talk about her, her burial, where exactly she was. And the fact that when Anne Boleyn was executed, she, her, her body was put into a, a arrow chest. So not a coffin and not a box big enough for a body. Um, and her head wrapped up and put in there with it, but of course not, it's not big enough for the whole body. Really gruesome to think of. Um, and I think that goes to show that they weren't expecting, that no one was really expecting it to actually happen, They're expecting a last minute pardon. Well, this is what I think, I could be wrong, but there was no prep, there was such a lack of preparation. Mind you, I don't know. Were their coffins prepared for anyone else? I'm not sure. Maybe it was just one of those things as well that they never did. I don't know. And maybe they decided, actually, (laughs) we've just killed a queen. We really should have her in a coffin. This was the closest thing they could find. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a good topic for a discussion with a historian at some point. Um, uh, Someone just asked if I like uh, like Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn, uh, to be honest, I think anyone, any historical character... And this, um, I think it's a danger. We're like, do we like them or do we not like them? I don't know. Do you like? Do you fully like everyone you meet in real life or not like everyone you meet in real life? Now they're they're the same. They're people, and it's um, they will have bits you like and they will have bits you don't like. Also, they're also, and I've said this before. We could know the same person now and have completely different opinions on their motivations around their actions. And they could be living now. They could be alive now. We could both know them. We might have differing opinions on their motivations. We're also trying to do that with someone who lived 500 years ago. You know, was, was Anne Boleyn power hungry? Was she a victim? Um, <laughs> can she be a bit of both? Of course she can. They can all be a bit of both. Can she have, um, hi, Rennie, how are you? Missed you too. Um, you know, can Anne Boleyn, can anyone be a bit of everything? And I think, yes. So yes, I do like her. <laughs> if that's, if that was a long way of answering that. Um, imagine is hi, how are you doing? My, one of my new patrons. Um, I don't know whether I like any historical character, basically, but I do find them immensely interesting and endlessly fascinating. Yes, indeed. Indeed, um, think about it when people do take a, a side, if you like, they, they either fully like someone or fully don't, it will close you down to listening to anything, or it can close you down, and we know people who this happens with, who they closes them down to listening to something that then doesn't fit in with their understanding. And if we can do anything with history, it is take a step back from something uh, or somebody and just be try and be objective now sorry i have missed a comment let me see if i can get it back um jenna since she was buried in an arrow box it was too small for a body would she have been short 
and that's how they were able to fit her body in. No, not to be too gruesome, I think they could fit her body in because she didn't have a head. Uh, Melly, how, how are you doing, Melissa? Um, and someone joining us from Indonesia, Yati Nerdin. Hello. So, yeah, I think that's, um, I think we can take that as a positive that we can, we can be objective about people in history, or I think we should be, and events. We we weren't there for a start. We weren't there and we're not there with most things now and we make opinions. Yeah. And then just what we can do is not close ourselves, try not to close ourselves off to information that then um goes against what we think we already understand or what we already know, or what we already be. Which, you know, this is what I'm talking about really, with books like The Sisters Who Would Be Queen from Leander. Um and um and uh blood fire and gold by estelle Peronk, they have both challenged my idea of elizabeth the first um yeah so there you go I, it's very it's endlessly interesting isn't it to talk about people but like i say i think <laughs> one of the interesting things probably we can't actually we can't actually know now um Sorry, someone earlier on asked about the uh, um, Bacton altar cloth. So I'm doing this off the top of my head, so excuse me, uh, but I have got um, a couple of reels about the Bacton altar cloth. Um, oh, hello, Emma Crini from Brazil. Um, uh, Melissa, Trace Borman did a three part series about Anne's downfall fall sorry she was standing in front of an arrow chest it was long enough to place stacks of arrows in but wasn't very wide mm. yeah well that's it as well i've never seen one in real life but I imagine so Anne must have been very very slim as well um sorry i've completely forgot what, what my i've lost my train of thought now i was just gonna say um tracy borman actually is she's speaking she's speaking on the tour in september um she's coming to heaver castle to speak to the group and she's speaking on the anne boleyn tour next may which um i've had a couple of inquiries about in the last couple of days so i think we're now fully booked if those go um if if those inquiries turn into bookings but tracy's coming to talk to us about the relationship between elizabeth and anne so Anne Boleyn and, and her daughter Elizabeth, um, she's got a new book coming out about that. So she'll be she'll be talking to the group about that next May as well, which is which is going to be um, amazing. Uh, so where else are we going on the tour? Uh, we're going to Barclay Castle in September, dressing up as Tudors while we're there, doing a little bit of a dance lesson, listening to some Tudor music, and also a falconry display so anyone um who you know you look into the tudors or even in the dramas they do this quite well falconry was a big deal in tudor um england with the royalty and the nobility and what i find really interesting about the falconry side of it uh, well, about falconry sorry is that the bird a bit like a dog you have if you want it to respond to you you train it there's no shortcut they don't give two hoots that you are Anne Boleyn or you are Henry VIII. <laughs> that bird is going to respond to you if you trained it, which means, um, which means that um, people like Henry VIII had to sleep near their birds when they were young. Uh, Catherine of Aragon also. So if you ever read Houses of Power by Simon Thurley, that's a great book. And um, he talks about the I think it was Whitehall, the layout at Whitehall. I might have that wrong, but um, no, it wouldn't be Whitehall because that, would, that wouldn't have been Catherine of Aragon, apologies. Um, but it might have been for Anne. Um, and they would have bedchamber next to the uh, to the muse. Um, and we're also going to Thornbury Castle. So all of these places Anne and Henry visited during their progress of 1535. Um, many of them actually well, the, like Elizabeth went on progress and visited Barclay a lot. Um, and uh, so anyway, but, but, but then that's by the by. So we're on progress with Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. So you can follow us 
on probably on my Instagram is the best place to follow the uh, the tour. And if you like the look of it, um, we are running it again next year in very end of June into July. Excuse me. So you'll be able to able to come along if you wish. Um, so that would that would be I would love to meet. Oh, there's so many of you who we've been conversing over the internet for so long, um, that that would be great to um, to meet you for real. So, uh, for, yes. So imagine this. From what I understand, from what I understand, and again, maybe this is another. If anyone's interested, maybe this could be another topic to discuss with a his, with a maybe a falconry expert. But from what I understand, yes, they had to train the birds. So they weren't sort of given over a trained bird. Um, uh, they had to be part of the training process, a big part of the training process. Um, so I was talking earlier about um, uh, my Patreon. So anyone who doesn't, who, who's interested, who doesn't know, I've completely rejigged it. So it's just five pounds a month now and you get everything involved. If you want to contribute more, there are uh, other tiers available for you to contribute more if you want to, but you don't have to, and you can join for five pounds a month. And one of the things you get is to ask historians your own questions. You get to see that extended version of every historian interview and it's ad free, which is, means it's far less irritating when you're watching and you have to skip all the adverts um you also get a blog each month <laughs> this month i did a blog on um what did i call it things they got wrong or something and i've gone i've i've talked about where experts in air quotes have categorically said that something will or more likely will not happen will not catch on one of them was the electric light bulb. Um, it just wouldn't catch on. But uh, hello over there in Costa Rica. Hello. Uh, yeah, that it just wouldn't, wouldn't catch on. Many around automobiles, uh, automobiles, check me out, I'm getting old cars. Um, I think there's, there's like, it's really, I, it was a really fun blog to write. I hope that the patrons, they seem to have really liked it. So um, it was really fun fun to what uh, to to write excuse me uh megan over there in tennessee how are you um hi everyone else i can see you joining where are you joining from let me know um and uh sorry i lost my train of thought again so we're um <laughs> uh mainly the horseless carriage was another one yes the yeah, automobile, horses, carriage. One of the places I was over the summer, um, there's low, well, where I was, there was lots and lots of old pubs. Um, hi, Mr. Happy over there in New York. And um, these old pubs, when you look at them from the outside, still have, um, they still have sort of coach entrances, places for the horses, places, um, mounting block, mounting blocks, excuse me. Um, you can see how they were used. And if you took the tarmac away from the outside and imagined a dirt track, they're exactly the same. The, the road width is exactly the same. You have to just pop your imagination goggles on and, um, and imagine what they would have been like. And actually one of the places I went to inside, they had lots of, um, photographs up on the wall and one of them was sort of the precursor to the bus it was a, a sharabang they call it with, with the horse drawn so i think it was four horses um and uh and yeah so it was um it was really nice actually to to imagine that and then i went into the pub and there was photos of it doug says someone said that the telephone wouldn't catch on in the uk because unlike in america we have plenty of messenger boys <laughs> I think there's a similar one, although I didn't find it for this blog, about cars and chauffeurs. That nobody would want to drive their own car because there's plenty of chauffeurs. Um, some of these probably need verifying, but anyway, it's, it's very funny. Um, also, the um, the motivation behind why some people said things would catch on and other things wouldn't catch on. 
is quite interesting you know people who had investments in an alternative to whatever it actually caught on in the end oh no that's definitely not going to happen there's also the fact that we can see in hindsight that something caught on but imagine some of the very new technology now are you really going to be able to call what is going to actually catch on and what isn't so oh and indita how are you over there in india i hope you're well it's been a while i've been gone a little while um what time are we on? Ooh, 10 minutes to the hour. We've been going for 50 minutes. Back to an altar cloth. I promise that. Sorry. So there's a reel about the back to an altar cloth. Um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, uh, but there is, I can't remember the lady's name, but a lady in waiting who served Elizabeth the first, um, got given one of, uh, well, the, they think, got given one of Elizabeth's dresses and she, the, 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 the church, um, Backton church is where her family, this lady's family, um, worshiped. And so it got given to the church and actually it was, it was looked after. I think the story sort of went that, that it had sort of been left on an altar to kind of decay, but um, when you watch a video, I think Tracy Borman actually went over to, um, to the chapel, to the church to have a look at it and it was framed and it was on the wall, um, behind glass. So it wasn't just out and left to rot, which I think the story sort of, when it was first broken, kind of gave the impression of, which I think is a bit naughty. Um, so it, and it's been on display since I saw it at Hampton Court Palace. It's had conservation work done on it and it does look incredibly like the, the panel in the dress that Elizabeth I was wearing in the rainbow portrait. Um, incredibly like it. Now, when you look at it up close, the embroidery, well, there's, there's a few things that are um, interesting about it. The, the pattern. So, the, the choice of um, the choice of the patterns, uh, the motifs, and the needlework, and I wish I'd have recorded because when when I went into the display at Hampton Court Palace, there was a few ladies there from an embroidery guild who'd come to see it, and this is where having a trade or having a, a something you you are actually. Um, I don't want to use the word expert. I think it's way too overused nowadays, but you have experience with. They were looking at this uh, at this this piece of cloth, the Bacton altar cloth, and they were looking and they were commenting on the types of stitches that had been used, the type of thread, all this stuff that, you know, if you've not done embroidery, I haven't, uh, then you wouldn't know to question. You wouldn't know, you wouldn't be able to glean any information from looking at the cloth other than just to look at it and go, oh, that's very pretty. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I'd had my camera on. Or maybe I could have spoken to them, but that that was fascinating. Um, but yeah, I have a reel with the Bacton altar cloth on it. If you want to go back and have a look, um, I will post it into my story in a bit later. Why don't I do that? I'll do that for you. So, um, so I'm here this week. I'm here next week. That may, I'll be here the week after, and then there'll be a week where I'm not here because, like I say, I'm on the On Progress with Anne Boleyn tour. So doing that in conjunction with Sarah Morris, who's the Tudor Travel Guide. And um, if you like the look of it and want to come on it, then we're doing it again next year. Um, the Anne Boleyn tour in May um, is pretty i think it's going to be full now i've had two inquiries like i say in the last few days and if they both turn to bookings they're full so um i might start looking at 2024 the life and times of elizabeth the first is going to be it's not we're not running that in we i'm not running that in 2023 it is going to be elizabeth the first and mary queen of scots we're going to do a bit of a jewel tour there we also have the six queens of Henry VIII running next year. And like I say, on progress with Anne Boleyn is going to be repeated as well. So I, was there anything else I was going to talk to you about today? Have a look out for Jay Britton's interview with me. That's already available on YouTube. She's talking, she's the Tudor songbook on Instagram and YouTube. She is, uh, yes, Melissa's coming on the Anne Boleyn tour. 
but it's going to come around yeah three years in the making oh i know i know yeah try and ignore the 2020 and 2021 um yes we've, we've got there we've got there we'll get there for yours i've got there this year so thankfully um Hi, Steph. How are you doing? Hello, Mary Beth in Pennsylvania. Thank you all. If you're new here, by the way, this is the first tea time live that some of you may have come across um, me doing because I, um, I said earlier when I last did a live, I had about nine thousand followers. I now have one hundred seven thousand followers, so I've gained nearly one hundred thousand followers uh, since my last live. It's now uh, come to a. a I don't know, it's slowed down the number of new people, but everyone is so welcome. Thank you so much for, for following me, for joining me. If you're following me on Instagram, you might want to go and follow me over on YouTube because that is where I post the historian interviews that I'm talking about. There's also virtual tours on there. There's all sorts. There's, there's quite a few talks and um, virtual tours on there now. And it's British history on YouTube. So I think you can go youtube.com forward slash forward slash C I don't know why, forward slash British history. And um, Steph's over there in Tennessee, another Tennessean. Um, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Mel. Um, <laughs> sorry, I keep losing my train of thought. You get into the hour. My teas, my, the caffeine in my tea is wearing off. Um, if you aren't a Patreon and you want a patron and you want to be over on Patreon, it's patreon.com forward slash British history. Um, to catch the historian interviews, that's what I was saying on YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash British history, or you can get to it by the link in my bio. I don't know why there has to be a C in there, but it apparently does. Um, and what about Netflix? What about Netflix? Oh, I missed something. <laughs> explain, explain, and I'll answer. Um, also, if you just want to help me out with my caffeine addiction, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Philippa. Nabbed that one early enough, didn't I? Um, Lynn over there in Malay Malaysia. 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 My, my mouth isn't, my words aren't coming out properly now. Um, and if you follow me on uh, YouTube, that also means you've probably got plenty of content in between my lives. <laughs> Patrons again, have 12 months exclusive, um, access to, uh, to some of these videos and they will be, um, but they, they then make them available after the 12 months. So yeah, go over to my YouTube, check that out. It's good. Um, resource i think for lots of different things i did quite a few virtual tours in lockdown so in 2020 because i had so much um i've been so many places <laughs> i've got so much footage that i managed to do some virtual tours um so you can check those out check out the interviews um and i also have a newsletter that's had a break over the summer that will be coming out again on Sunday so if you are interested in getting a newsletter it basically has the links to all these things I've been talking about um you can um you can go uh, sorry you can sign up for that for free in my um, my bio or on my website which is britishhistorytours.com um oh okay Ren's Ren's lesser was asking me anything to watch on Netflix. I don't know, actually, I've been, I've been absent for a couple of months, really, off any TV or um, anything. So I haven't seen Becoming Elizabeth, which is probably um, an anathema to everyone else, but I don't have stars and I couldn't be bothered to start subscribing to a new channel when I was about to go away. So anybody here seen Becoming Elizabeth and would you recommend an actual new subscription in order to watch it peaky blinders melissa says is that on netflix peaky blinders i'm not sure but watch peaky blinders peak oh i know i know one i know one okay ladies the last kingdom and um <laughs> you need to watch the last kingdom just do it you'll be thankful you'll thank me for it um for my birthday my friend sent me a picture it's only a picture of a t-shirt uh, with Uhtred in a t-shirt saying 
Good girls go to heaven, bad girls go to Beben, Bebenthen. What's it called? Where's the place called that he lives? Um, with Uhtred. Jenna says, Becoming Elizabeth, I need to watch it. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll take your word for it. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> right, everyone, it is one minute to two o'clock here. Um, Steph's watching The Last Kingdom right now. Yep, good. I might watch it again. And to be fair as well, it is, I think, a great introduction to Anglo-Saxon England, which can be incredibly complex to try and understand. I've spoken about this a few times before as well because it's fascinating. This is the... Um, the formation of the country which William of Normandy came over and you know took over, but it, it but it, it it's not complete. Like a, a century before, it's not England. It's not Angleland. It's not the land of the Angles. Um, let me have a look. My journey. The only thing this newfangled Instagram timeline has done during lockdown before me muting it was good for. Oops, suggesting a post of yours. Ah, oh, I had recently. Oh right, okay. Ah. So some people have come across me um, randomly, but I'm glad. Is Last Kingdom on Netflix? I think it's on Netflix. Um, oh, Bree says The Serpent Queen about Catherine de' Medici. Yes, I've heard about this. Yes. And Jenna says Last Kingdom is fascinating. It does help to understand the history of Anglo-Saxon England a lot. If you are interested in Anglo-Saxon England, I also have an interview <laughs> with um, Dr. Elizabeth Norton, who wrote a book about Elfrith. She's the first crowned queen of England. Um, so that is another one to check out if you're interested in, um, in Anglo-Saxon England, which if you don't think you are, it's just that you've not had the hook yet. It is fascinating, <laughs> fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Over in my Patreon, if you're new over on Patreon and you're interested, have a look back to where I covered Deerhurst and Odders Chapel. Uh, Vi oh yes, Vikings is also over there on Netflix. Uh, Valhalla, that's it, Valhalla, yeah. Um, oh, I like these suggestions. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that'll keep us all going. For the week won't it the weekend's coming up and it's, it's winter's rolling in <laughs> we, we need to have our watch list ready um so amy's asking about becoming elizabeth and is it worth watching i haven't watched it other people are saying it is definitely worth a watch so that means i have to do a star subscription <laughs> so i shall do that okay everyone we are now past two o'clock. We've been going over an hour. Thank you so much for joining me for this first back after the summer. That's the wrong way of putting the words around. Uh, Thursday tea time, live history chat. I'm getting all my words in the wrong order right now. So it is time to go. I will see you tomorrow for visiting Tudor Britain at four o'clock. I am hosting tomorrow. So it'll be on at British underscore history underscore tours on Instagram. I will be joined by Sarah Morris, the Tudor travel guide and Deb Royal from Tudor Times and Tudor Places magazine. Uh, we will be talking about the places we have visited over the summer with Tudor Connections. So join me at four o'clock tomorrow if you are around on uh, YouTube. Go, out, go off and check my historian interviews that are available and have a great day, everyone. The rest of your day, I will speak to you soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.